that amen first first uh, Romans chapter 7 tonight please Romans chapter number 7 Romans chapter 7, and let's, excuse me, let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to back up just a little bit, begin our reading in verse number 7, part of the passage that we dealt with last week. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse number 7, what shall we say then, is the law sin, God forbid? Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, which is intense lust. For without the law sin was dead, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died, and the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then which is, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. <clears throat> but sin, that might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Excuse me. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And let's pray. Lord God, thank you that we have your words and that we are confident that what we have is accurate, and authoritative. And I pray, Lord, that you would give to us an understanding of them, that they would not be mere gibberish to us, but that they would be the very words of God, food for our soul, hope for our lives. And I pray this for us in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may, of course, be seated. Once again, let's begin at the beginning and recover where we are to this point in the book of Romans. We are sinners. We are sinners. If we are not sinners in our own sight, we are certainly sinners in God's sight. And God has concluded every human being into the state of sinfulness and therefore worthy of his righteous condemnation. We have all failed to live to the righteousness of, that God demands, which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But God has provided for us a substitute. God has provided for us his son, Jesus Christ, who has lived out all of God's righteous demands. And we may have the salvation that he offers only, only by faith. Only as we believe in our own sinfulness, And in his own acceptable substitution, can we have the righteousness that God demands applied to our own name, applied to our own life, technically applied to our own sinful account. 
And when that happens, when we come to faith, come to Christ by faith, <clears throat> there is a tremendous, invisible, but very real change in the way we are related not only to God, but to sin. And therefore, we should not sin. And in Romans 6 and 7, Paul has articulated, at least the way that I'm presenting it, as I understand it, three clear and distinct reasons why we who believe should not sin. One has to do with union, or the word that I would use for the sake of alliteration, membership. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 12 that we are members of his body in particular. We were joined in union, in a living union with the righteous one, Jesus Christ. And we are members of his body. We should not sin because we are members of his body. Furthermore, we should not sin because Christ the righteous one is our master. And there is a principle in the world that the one you obey is the one who is your boss. And so if we obey sin, if we commit sin, we are bearing testimony to the fact that sin is our master when as believers Christ is our master and he is righteous. And thirdly, Paul articulates that we should not sin because we are married to the righteous one. And when he talks about that marriage, folks, you notice that we occupy the position of the bride. And we know that God's will is that the wives are in submission to their husbands. And since we function in this world as Christ's wife, it is his will that we are in submission to him and his will for us is righteousness. And in fact, we have been freed from the law so that we can be married to him. So we should not sin because we are members of Christ, because he is our master, and because we are married to him. And yet the reality is that we sin. We have good reason not to sin. We have a mandate not to sin. And yet we do sin. And Paul then explores this question, is the reason that we sin then the fact of the law? Is the law sin? In other words, if we could just now, and, and this is a serious question, folks, and you've got to understand that it is a question that doesn't exist outside of the church. It exists very much inside of the church. Could we eliminate sin by eliminating the law? Is that a possibility? If every church just absolutely stopped talking about anything that resembled, anything that looked like a law, anything that looked like a requirement or a rule or a regulation, is that the end of sin? And the answer to that, by the way, folks, is no. That doesn't mean that churches don't periodically get carried to extremes and go overboard. But we must understand, folks, because this is what the text is clearly teaching us, that simply eliminating anything that looks like a rule does not eliminate sin. And the reason for that is because sin has its very own existence and its very own identity that does not require the law. Sin didn't come into existence just simply because God said, don't. Now, <clears throat> all right, let me give you a very graphic illustration of this and one that we're going to deal with in the not-too-distant future. <clears throat> in Genesis 19, God rained down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah. He completely eradicated the valley. Those were very real people. You can read about the very realness of their lives in Genesis 13 and 14. <clears throat> Lot moved into Sodom, he dwelt there, lived in the city, interacted with the elders of the city, the kings got involved, they, they didn't spend all their time just committing homosexual acts, they, they waged war against each other, and there's the war in Genesis 14, and God rained down fire and brimstone upon them. There was no law against <clears throat> anything that they were doing. You can't find a law to that point, Genesis chapter 19, 
against what they had done. You can find God's verdict. God had come to the conclusion that he tells us about right after Lot moved there that these were people who were sinful and exceedingly wicked and that's how God viewed them but there was no law that defined their sin. The absence of law, folks, is not the absence of sin. We do not necessarily do ourselves any favors by just keep removing law and keep taking things out of the way so that there's no such thing as law. Now, that's not really where we are this evening. That's, I'm not all the way down that road. But, but Paul puts us in that place and wants us to understand that principle. <clears throat> Our text this evening is really verse beginning in verse number 13 down through verse number 24. And you'll notice that I didn't read to the end of the chapter. We will deal with the answer to the dilemma in a separate sermon. And what I wish to do with verses 13 through 24 is not just deal with them in sequence, but deal with them in theme. In these verses, Paul is making three points that he articulates and develops. Point number one is this. The law is good. The law is good. Now, we talked about this last week, that the law, that the law is, not an, is not an enemy. The law is good. And in verse number 12, Paul points out the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. There's more to the law, folks, and we'll spend some time looking. There's more to the law than just simply do this, don't do this. So the, the entirety of the law is holy. And its commandments are holy and just and good. The law is a good thing. Its commandments are holy. They are without sin. They are just. They are righteous. They are good. They are honorable. And they are useful. Paul then, on the basis of what he says in verse number 12, asks a question for us to consider in verse number 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? Was that which is good made death to me. The law is good. Is God trying to kill us with the law? Is that the point of the law? Is the point of the law to bring us to death, to kill us? That's the question that he's asking. The law is good. What is its intent? Is it to bring us to the point of death? And once again, we have Paul's by now standard response to that kind of question, God forbid. Why is that so? Paul goes on in verse number 13 to give the explanation, but sin, that it might appear sin working death in me. The law is not what causes death. Sin is what causes death. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. The law is not a problem, folks. Sin is the problem. And simply getting rid of the law doesn't get rid of sin. What the law does is shine the spotlight on sin so we see how bad sin actually is. So that what is clearly seen, folks, is that what is killing us is not the law, but sin. Sin is the enemy. The law is not an enemy. The law is good. And so the law is doing its work. And I mentioned last week, and I think it's really an apt illustration, the, the law of God is like our bathroom scale. It is just simply a statement of fact. And sometimes the fact that it reveals is exceeding unpleasant. Well, the holidays are here, and I know that I ate too much and probably put on a few pounds. And then you step on the scale, and the scale doesn't go, yeah, you put on a few pounds. The scale goes, here's the number. And we go, and let's be realistic, folks. There, So many of us hate the scale that... Frequently, we don't want to go to the, see the doctor because we know the first thing that they're going to do is put us on it. 
And then they're going to make a record <clears throat> of what we weigh. And then the next time we go back, we're going to have to have another conversation with the doctor about last time's record versus this time's record. Is the scale the problem? No. Is the scale trying to kill me? No. The scale is just magnifying what the problem may or may not be. And for those of you who don't live in that universe, for whom this is not an issue, may I just express my undying contempt for you. <laughs> With all the charity that I can muster, which is not much. The law is not an enemy. The law is good. And we don't help ourselves by simply ignoring the law, getting rid of the law. I mean, just to be absolutely ludicrous, folks, if we, if we abolished murder as a crime, if we just did away with it religiously, never preached another sermon that it was a sin to commit murder, that it was a sin to commit murder in the New Testament sense of hating our brother, well, would that fix anything? No. No. Because the law isn't the problem. The law is, is showing us what the problem is. The law is the spotlight to tell us what the problem is. Murder will always be a problem. Law or no law. And this is because Romans 7, 14, we know, right? And by the way, folks, and, and there's, I, I mention this only because if you start to do any of the reading, you'll discover there's a whole world of debate about whether Paul is talking about lost people or saved people, which is an argument completely lost on me. It is not possible for lost people to wrestle through the issues of Romans 7. Lost people aren't having the struggle that saved people have when it comes to sin. So Paul returns to his summary statement in verse number 14. We know. You and me, brothers, those of us that know the law, those of us that know Christ as Savior as well, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now let's make, please make sure that we note the distinction here, verse number 14. When Paul's talking about spiritual and carnal, he's not talking about immaterial versus material. Carnal isn't describing something that is material and spiritual describing something that is immaterial. Spiritual is describing something that is rightly related to God and carnal is describing something that is not rightly related to God. The law is spiritual. The law is spiritual. The law is rightly related to God and in fact the law is doing His work because the law is on God's side, if you want to look at it that way. The law is God's ally. The law is sin's enemy, but it is God's ally. <clears throat> and Paul will point out a little bit later in the text, we'll look at it, that we who believe actually attest to this fact. We don't stand outside of the fact we as believers don't look at the law and go, oh, it's a terrible thing. At least we're not supposed to. We are supposed to recognize the beauty and the value of the law. So there's the first point that Paul develops. The law is good. The law is good. The second point that Paul develops in verses 13 through 24 is that sin is treacherous. It's not just sin. It's not just the violation of the command. It is that, but there's more to it than that. And Paul <clears throat> begins to identify that. We read it in verse number 8, which was really not a part of our text this evening, but let's go back and look. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment. Right, so sin takes advantage of the commandment. The commandment becomes its opportunity, wrought in me all manner of, of concupiscence. <clears throat> and again, Paul uses <clears throat> three variations of the same emotion, if you will, there in verses 7 and 8. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid I had not known sin, but by the law 
illustration for I had not known lust. There's the, there's the, the raw emotion. <clears throat> Except the Lord said, thou shalt not covet. <clears throat> there's the emotion. And then sin enters into the picture, taking advantage of that commandment and stirs up my lust, concupiscence. Same emotion, three different words to describe it. Now, lust has always been wrong. God has always despised lust. But we did not always know that God despised lust until we had the law. But when the law came in and shined the light and said lust is a bad thing, there is another party to the equation, and that is the party of sin. And sin said, in effect, oh, lust is wrong, huh? Well, then, let me whip up a big old batch of covetousness. That's the way sin operates. Sin is treacherous. Sin is a killer, Romans 7, 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. Sin takes advantage of the law. Sin finds out what is wrong and then works in us to have an appetite for that which is wrong, to stir up our appetite. Sin does not go through our lives as some kind of a neutral party, indifferent to us, but hostile only to God. It is at work in us. <clears throat> Let us recall the words of Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin... And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. There's no way to count it. There's no good system of record keeping in the absence of the law. Nevertheless, death reigned because the law doesn't cause death, sin does. From Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that is to come. So sin is treacherous because of the way it uses the goodness of the law to stir me up in rebellion against God. But that's not all, folks. Romans seven fourteen. sin is also a master. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am not. I am carnal. And I am sold under sin. Now again, if you begin to read and go to the internet and read on Romans 7.14, there is a great range of opinions about what Paul actually means. But I think he's talking about the fundamental nature of human flesh. Think of it this way. Think, think of your very young children or your young grandchildren. Too, too young to be saved. Too young to understand the gospel message, the demands that are placed upon them. They are nevertheless sold under sin. They have to be taught to do right, but they've never one time had to been taught to do wrong. They do wrong by default. They disobey easily and naturally. They are ungrateful easily and naturally. They are disrespectful easily and naturally. They take what belongs to others easy and naturally. It is their nature. All of the good must be imparted to them, taught to them, disciplined into them, trained repeatedly into them. Why is this so? Because they are carnal, sold under sin. That is their nature. That is our nature. We were no different. <clears throat> it is our very nature. <clears throat> Paul will come back and elaborate on that in, later on in Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> what this means for us. 
But let's just talk about for now the way Paul is describing himself because he's using all of these first person pronouns. He's talking about himself. <clears throat> Paul, the great apostle. Certainly the greatest New Testament Christian, the man who most fully embodied, the man that God could use to say to us repeatedly, be like Paul, be like Paul, be like Paul, says about himself, I am carnal, sold under sin. Now he's not arguing that he gives himself over to sin. You'll never find these words coming from Paul, folks. You'll never find this sentiment coming from Paul. Now that I am free from the law, I am free to sin. Now that I am free from the law, sin has been redefined until it's no longer sin. I can do what I want. Paul never says anything like that anywhere. Sin sold me into slavery. Sin was my master. And it treated me harshly. This does not mean that Paul is without power. And it does not mean that Paul is without responsibility. It simply means this is a fact of human existence. We are sinners by nature. We were born sinners. We were born in that condition with Adam's fall as being slaves to sin. And that part of our body, the flesh, will always be in that state. Always. It will always be a part of all that we do. This is the state of our fleshly nature. Again, not, our, not just our body nature, not, not that which is physical, which can be used for righteousness, Romans 6, or for sin, but of our flesh, the impulse of our desire, that which answers to sin, that which finds satisfaction in sin, that which finds desire for sin. Sin will always be our master. <clears throat> So the law is good, Paul argues, that is his first point. The law is treacherous, it is a master that sells us, that leads us to death. And Paul then comes to point number three. Therefore, therefore, we who believe are miserable. We who believe are miserable. We live in this divided state. We live in this condition every moment of every day. Verses 15 through 24 are the explanation of Romans 7, 14. We know that the law is spiritual. We know that the law is good. I know that, but I also know this. I am carnal and sold under sin. And I have to live with that every day of my life. And this is how it looks, verse 15. That which I do, I allow not. I do things I don't permit myself to do. Do we ever do that? Do we know what that is as a believer? Do we know what that is to resolve that we're not going to do something? Do we know what it is to do things and go, I don't know why I did that. I would never support it. I would never endorse it. It's wrong to have done. That which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. What does it mean to be carnal, sold under sin? It means that what I desire to do and what I actually do are frequently at odds. Paul doesn't mean that he gives permission to this. He means that I don't give permission to this. I don't do the things I would do. I don't do the things that I know on my will and spirit are right to do. But instead, what I do are the things that I hate. What I hate that I do. Paul doesn't say, I do things about which I am ambivalent, undecided. Paul said, I do things that I hate. I do the very things that I hold in contempt. Why? Because I am carnal, sold under sin. And this then leads me to this testimony. This is Paul's testimony, Romans 
7.16, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Right? God says the law is good, and when I say I shouldn't have done that, it was wrong, I'm saying that the law is good. If I lie and then go, I shouldn't have told that lie, I am bearing witness to the fact that the law is good when it said, Thou shalt not bear false witness. If I have berated my neighbor or lied about my neighbor or criticized my neighbor, and then I go, that was a wrong thing to do, I bear witness to the goodness of the law which says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. When we are convicted about our sin, folks, it says volumes not only about the goodness of the law, but about the heinousness of sin. And Paul then concludes in verse number 17, so now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. There is something more in work, is what he's saying. And again, none of these verses, folks, are designed to absolve Paul of the responsibility but they are the explanation for why it is so, right? I know I'm a sinner. I came to Christ to be saved from my sin, and yet here I am. I'm, I'm 40 years into this, folks. I'm still a sinner. What is the problem? And it's more than an intellectual problem. It's always more than an intellectual problem. It is a problem of the existence of sin. And sin has a power over me that I cannot control. Not by resolve. Not by human personality and design. Right? This is one of the flaws of the world. Right? I, remember, I remember this was, this was years, years and years ago. One of the morning news shows that somebody, some, some band of scientists had assembled an automobile that no matter how you tried to drive it, imitated driving conditions as if you were under the influence of alcohol. And so they got a group of teenagers together and they made them drive this car around so they could see what it'd be like to drive drunk. And the end conclusion was don't drive drunk. And the only problem with that is, folks, is that when people get drunk, their judgment is impaired. So they don't remember, oh yeah, that's right, I can't do this. They go, oh, I can do anything. Or we wage these multi-million dollar campaigns saying to children, just say no. As if, as if that was the easiest, that's all there is to it, right? Just say no. I can't, I can't say no to a second helping. Just say no. Just say no to hating God. Just say no to criticizing other people. Just say no. Just say no to greed and lust and covetousness. Just say no. Paul follows that up with verses 18 through 20. He just, he's just continuing to give the explanation, not the defense. Right? Paul is not going to conclude with, right? and I, I hope we understand this. Well, now, so now we're hopeless, and now there's no help, and now all is doomed, and so just abandon yourself to whatever lust you have because there's no choice. That is not where Paul goes. But he does go here, for I know that in me that is in my flesh, again, not our body, but that invisible driving force controlled by sin dwelleth no good thing. How do I know that? For to will is present with me. I know it is right. I want to do right. I know that I should do right. I know that it would be better for everybody if I did do right. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. Now personally, this is just pastoral reflection. There are a couple of writers that I like to read because they are so good at defining the human condition. But they're lost people, and they have absolutely no ability to know what the answer is. But they're very helpful because they can put real meaning to what Paul is telling us in a sentence. 
For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. I know what's wrong, but within me I don't know where to go from there. For the good that I would, verse 19, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. The constant fight, the constant dilemma, the constant debate, which leads Paul to this conclusion. Verse number 20, now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. In other words, if, if there's a very real desire to do that which is right, that finds itself with, at war with a very real desire to not do that which is right, how do we explain that? What is the explanation for that? So it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. There is living in me sin. And so there is a law, verse number 21, not a law of Moses' law, but a law like the law of gravity law. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And when Paul says present with me, he is using really a very intimate expression. It's, not, it's, it's way beyond sin is in the same room. It's like, here's the law. When, when you want to do good, Sin gives you a bear hug. It's a word that could be used to describe cuddling a baby. When you want to do good, when a believer wants to do good, sin reaches out and puts its arms around you. That's the law. That's the law. If you drop something, if it falls out of your hand, it is going to the ground, right? You've you've never dropped your phone and had it fall upwards. It always goes crashing to the ground because there's a law. And there's a law for believers that when we want to do good, evil is right there clutching at us. And this is because, verse number 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And we'll get to this, folks, and... Right? I mean, again, because there's a whole body of Christianity, professing Christianity, that seems to find no greater pleasure than in running away from right and wrong and the law as quickly as it can, which is completely contrary to what the Scripture teaches. Paul says the law is a good thing and I love it. The law is a good thing and I love it. There's a part of me that really loves the law. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I have an appetite for it. I crave it. I want to know what it teaches and live it out in its fullness. But there's another law, verse 23, in my members, in my eyes and in my brain and in my ears and in my hands and in my feet, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity, the law of sin which is in my members. So always the fight, always the struggle, always the adversary, Always, for true believers, the competing conflict. Which sounds really very discouraging. And let's be realistic, at times it can be very discouraging. But I would just point out, folks, that its presence should not be as discouraging as its absence. Anybody who says, I'm saved, but I don't know, I have no idea what that is. And we'll get to this because some people teach that total perfection was possible, but I don't think that's what Paul is teaching. Right? Its presence, its very presence is a source of consolation to us, but Paul doesn't go there. <clears throat> Paul just raises the question in verse number 24. And he uses the word, Wretched, and it's a beautiful word. I use the word miserable. Oh, wretched man that I am. Where is my deliverance? Now, before we get to the answer, this, right? Let's think about what the answer isn't. 
The answer is not us all by ourselves. Steely resolve. The answer is not us all by ourselves. We are no match for sin. But neither is the answer the law. The answer is not the law. Who shall deliver me? More law. The answer, folks, is Christ. This is what Paul argues. This is, this is where he goes next. And, and in this beautiful, right? If you recall, back when we started in chapter 5, one of the things I said was that chapter 5, 6, and 7 all are dealing with a common theme, the common theme of which is hope. Right? Hope from the freedom of sin is found in Christ, not in ourselves, not in the law, but in Christ. Christ our master, Christ our spouse, Christ the head of our body. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And in verse number 25, Paul thanks God. We'll look at this. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. God has the answer, and the answer is his son. Let's stop there this evening. And we'll pray. You can stand. We'll pray. We'll have our closing song. And we will be dismissed. Father, thank you for the greatness of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that we would learn to be oriented properly and rightly to him and to his righteousness. Thank you that there is this glorious answer for what appears to be an insurmountable problem. That the dominion of sin is broken through the only one who can dominate him, Jesus Christ. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.